Good morning, everybody. If I haven't met you before, my name's Stu, and it's a great privilege to come to continue our series in Matthew. And kids, I hope you have a good time. You'll have to tell us what you'll learn about when you come back. <laughs> it sounds like it's a good time in there already. <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? I just came back from Solis and I was preaching at Solis and someone hadn't closed the door of the kids' room and it was so loud, it was awesome. But I was tempted, even though I was preaching, not to close it because it was just delightful hearing all these kids. But um, then I got asked to close it, so we closed it. But um, yeah, it's lovely to have children, isn't it? I was just watching them while we were singing. Did you see their faces? Just the, as they were soaking it all in, as they were enjoying that, it was lovely. Well, what we're going to do today uh, is we're going to have a look in our story in Matthew at chapter 7 of Matthew. And we're going to do something a bit different today for a bit of fun. We're going to compare Matthew chapter 7 with Matthew 21. So we're going to look at a little bit at the teaching of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and look at how he brings it home at the end of his ministry. And the, the one question that unites the two passages of um, chapter 7 and chapter 21 is the question, how are we to be saved? Can we be saved? So we're going to look at that question of how does Jesus save us today? And we're going to use chapter 7 and chapter 21 to do that. Now, before I begin, I want to tell you a little quick story about when I was at university. I started university at the age of 18, and I, I just scraped into uni by the skin of my teeth. And um, I just got a, a mark to get into uni. I don't know why I wanted to go to uni, but I just had this thing that I wanted to. And as it turned out, when I got there, I realised why, because I bummed around for seven years and just had a pretty good relaxing time. And the reason was because I got into an arts course. And I don't know if you know anything about university, but an arts course is probably derided as the uh, not only just the get in by the skin of your teeth course, but it's... It's the most relaxed, easy course you can do. I was doing things like Australian literature too, reading poetry. I was doing government about politics and all these things that I studied were I like, were never going to get me a job, but it was heaps of fun. I looked at um, theology and all sorts of fun stuff. Anyway, I, I had a lovely time there, but one of the interesting things about my uni days was I got really convicted as a young man that to live as a Christian was the most important thing I needed to learn how to do. And so while I was at university and I enjoyed my courses, I really got excited about the university Christian group and I went along there hungry, really hungry as a young man to listen and to try and find out how I could live as a Christian young man. That's what I was really keen to do. So I went along uh, very hungry and I sat, I remember sitting in a lecture theatre, it was Sydney University and I don't know who was talking, but there was someone down the front talking and this gentleman came and sat next to me, he was a bit older than me, he was probably about 25, he came and sit next to me. I thought he must have been an older student or a tutor or something and he got talking to me after the lecture uh, that we were in and it turns out he's from America and that was cool and he was talking to me about America. I never met an American actually before because I was from the Sutherland Shire and we don't get out much in the Sutherland Shire and so <laughs> particularly back in the 1980s yeah so um, I didn't even know what sushi was do you remember that movie The Breakfast Club when Molly Ringwell gets out her lunch and she has sushi I remember in the movie theater looking at my friends going what's she eating like and what are those things she's holding I didn't even know what chopsticks were anyway so I was a bit naive when I went along to uni so this American guy sits next to me and I'm a little bit fascinated he's quite exotic oh this guy's from America He's from the land of Hubba Bubba Chewing Gum. You know, like this guy, this guy is from the land of Molly Ringwald. Like I might get to know him a bit better. So I was instantly drawn to him and I wanted to chat with him. And I thought he was part of the Christian group there at the university, you see. So I'm sitting in this university group feeling really safe as a naive young person that I could trust everybody in the room. And I'm sitting here with this American guy and he says, do you want to read the Bible together with me? I'm like, this is great. Like I want, I'm hungry to be a Christian young man. Not only do I get to go to a lecture, I've got this... This guy who's a bit older than me wanting to read the Bible with me, I said, yeah, of course. So the next day I met him at the Merriweather building. We got hot chips and gravy, which was my favourite, and a can of Coke. That was my staple for seven years. Don't know how I survived, but I, that, I do know what effect it had on my body. But um, uh, we're sitting there having hot chips and gravy and a little bit of tomato sauce, actually. I like a little bit of Marty sauce. That was on top. And we're sitting there talking about Jesus. And it all started really well. And it was so good that he said, do you want to get together again tomorrow? I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is fantastic. This is like... A, like a dream this guy wants to meet with me again tomorrow well, okay so I met with him again and again and every day that week he wanted to meet and I'm like this is really good I was getting up in the morning getting excited to go dive into God's word with this guy and learn more stuff but on the Friday he says to me and he asked me this question he says have you been baptized and I said yeah yeah when I was a little kid oh you call that baptism I said yeah yeah I think so he goes have you been baptised by full immersion as an adult? 
And I said, what's being baptised by full immersion as an adult? He says, when you go into the water and go under the water and then come back up, and you've got to be an adult to do that. I'm like, oh. So I started to get a bit nervous. And then he said on top of that, not only do you need to be baptised as a Christian, you need to be baptised or you don't get to go to heaven. And I started going, oh. Now, this guy had built up trust with me over the last four days, and I'm, I'm in the palm of his hand. Like This guy could have told me to go and jump off the gap, and I would have thought that was something worth thinking about. So he says this, and I'm like a bit, oh, maybe I'm not. He says, if you haven't been baptised by full immersion, you're not a Christian, Stu, and you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh, I'd never heard this before. And I'm thinking, naive, sullen, shy guy, maybe I haven't got the whole of the gospel. And this guy's telling me stuff that I haven't learned. And I wanted to grow as a Christian young man, but I was a bit overthrown now because possibility is I'm not a Christian. And he goes even further. He says, unless you get baptised in our church, you're not a Christian. I said, well, what church are you? Aren't you part of the university group? He said, no, I'm not part of the university group. I just go along to meet people. And then I started going, oh, hang on, something smells a bit fishy here. And he says, I'm part of a group called the Sydney Church of Christ. Now, there is a Church of Christ in Australia, so I thought, I've got some friends who are in the Church of Christ, and I thought, oh, okay, that's not too dodgy. It must be just an American form of the Church of Christ. But I did, get, did go after that when he said that, and I went up to one of the leaders of the Christian group, and I said, there's a man who's told me that I'm not a Christian unless I'm baptised by full immersion in the church of his church, which is the, what did I call it? The Sydney Church of Christ. Sydney church of Christ. And then the blood drained out of this guy's face at the Sydney University group. It was called EU. That was the Evangel Evangelical Union or something. Anyway, he said, um, oh, no, that guy's a cult. I said, a cult? What's a cult? I, this is how naive I am. Like, here I am going, what's sushi? And I don't know what a cold is either. He goes, oh, they've got into the group again. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what it is is there's a group called the Brooklyn Church of Christ that have sent missionaries to Australia to try and grow their church. And they go around saying that unless you are baptised by full immersion in the, their church, which they now call the Sydney Church of Christ, you're not a Christian. And they're causing all sorts of fear and confusion amongst the young people in our university group because it's making people think that Jesus is not enough. You need Jesus and their church because unless you're baptised in their church, you're not a Christian. How do we defend ourselves against stuff like that? Because for the next week or two, he wouldn't stop ringing me. When I didn't turn up the next Tuesday for our Bible study, he rang me, where are you, where are you? And luckily in those days, or fortuitously or whatever a more appropriate Christian word is for that, it was the years of a landline. So when he rang, I got my mother to answer the phone and she gave him what for. And if you've ever met my mother, she is a really lovely Christian lady, but you don't mess with her. So someone was messing with her son's faith and she told him to get on another train and <laughs> don't come back to the Southern Shire train station. So my mum sent him packing, which was good, and the university group clamped down on this cult that had got into the group. But the question I've got today is how, how can you be sure that the teaching you're getting is good and how can you be sure you know the gospel so you can be sure you're saved? Well, the great news is we have everything we need to understand our salvation in the scriptures. And if we read our scriptures, we can test and approve every teaching. What I love about PAC is when I come here that there is such a high regard for the, the word of God. Because as a guest preacher, we all know, don't we, that I am also, along with all of us, sitting under the authority of the Word of God today. So what I say doesn't have authority. What I say is trying to uh, explain and expound uh, the teaching of the Bible. And so when we trust in the Word of God, we have our authority in place. And over coming months, I actually needed help to recover from that incident. And Christians helped me to recover from that cult leader. And do you know how they helped me to recover? They took me back to the Word of God and actually did a proper Bible study. Not use it as a tool of manipulation, but use it as a tool to free me. Because I got told by my tutor at uni that if you can learn to read the Bible for yourself, you'll be free. Because you won't need to rely on anybody else to tell you how to be saved. You'll know how to be saved because the Bible has enough for you to be saved. And that's why we open it together and we have it open. The passages I've chosen for today are helping us to know how to be careful of what to listen to. And Jesus in his opening statement in chapter 7 begins by this phrase, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That is a direct warning to that man from the Sydney Church of Christ. For him to claim that he and his church had the only source of salvation, judging me for not being a Christian because I hadn't been baptised by full immersion in his church, 
he should be very, very careful because with the same measure he was using to judge me, he will be judged. And if he actually diverts from Scripture, Jesus is going to go on to say, be very careful because if you divert to the left or the right of the gospel, it's not the gospel anymore. If you add to or take away from the gospel, it's not the gospel anymore. And unfortunately, the symbol of baptism, he was using that to add to the gospel, saying it's not enough for you to put your faith in Jesus and repent of your sins. As Billy Graham said in 1959, very clearly to the whole of Australia, particularly in Melbourne, what, what he was doing was you need Jesus plus our church and then you're saved. So Jesus says, be very careful, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? That man would have done very well to think about his own theology and his own teaching before he tried to impose it on me and judge me for whether I was a Christian or not. And likewise, as Christians, we've got to be very careful that we don't judge other people harshly. We have to be careful that we don't add to or take away from the gospel as we disciple one another. We can't put extra yoke on someone's back that isn't the yoke of Jesus. If we add to the yoke of Jesus or we take it away, it's not the yoke of Jesus anymore. So I can't stand up here and tell you as an Anglican minister how I think the Anglican church is the source of all truth for the Christian world and we need to take on board everything that my particular tradition teaches because that would be adding to the gospel, wouldn't it? What we do beautifully when we come together as Christians in this context is that I and you sit under the authority of God's word and we both agree to preach what we agree on, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and what beautiful unity and fellowship can we have in Christ as we do that together. He was breaking fellowship and breaking unity, and after all, Jesus is saying, be very careful because in verse 5, you're a hypocrite. If you don't first take out the plank in your own eye and then you'll see more clearly how to remove the speck in your brother's eye. Be very careful as you come to Jesus that you have nothing in your hands. Because I think the reason that people can't see the sin in their own life and they look for the sin in someone else's life and judge them is because they first haven't come humbly with nothing in their hands. If we come to Jesus with something to offer Jesus then we produce an arrogant pride that is not of the people of God and it results in us judging each other and and judging other people for how we think we're better than them. But what Jesus does really clearly is he says, um, I'm going to jump over here down into, there's so much stuff we can unpack here, but I want to breeze over this a little bit today. But if we go back down there to verse 7, Jesus is going to put in place something that's going to be very helpless to understand how not to judge other people. So the judge do not judge part is part of the humility from the blessedness. Remember the the key verses that we started off with with the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you who are humble. So again, can you see the link between blessed are you who are humble? You won't judge other people, will you? You won't look down on other people and think you're better than anyone else. You'll put yourself on the same level as everyone else. And then if you're in that state, verse 7, this is how you come to God. So the way you relate to other people is, first of all, you have to remember your relationship with God and get that right and then make sure that that is right before you relate to other people all the time. That's uh, a really healthy way to think about it. So in verse 7, Ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock on the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or which, if you ask for a fish, will give you a snake? If you then... Although one of my Aboriginal friends laughed at me when I preached on this once, just to pause there for a second in verse 10. Or if you ask for a fish who will give him a snake, he goes, oh, you haven't been in our mob very long, bro. Sometimes I prefer an old red belly black snake to an old yellow tail fish. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, that's a bit of a different one. But I said to him in the Jewish culture, I don't think they had red belly black snakes that they liked to eat on. But, um, yeah, that's that just a nice little Australian aside there, I thought. But anyway, I'll move on. Um, basically, the argument goes on in verse 11. If you then, th- though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good gifts if you ask for him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. See, what Jesus does is he completely produces for us two opposites in this passage. The first is don't judge other people. But instead, ask your heavenly Father for what you need and he will be pleased to give it to you. And if you, as evil as you are, know how to give good things to your kids, if my kids ask for chips and gravy, 
I don't give them a bit of lemon off a tree and say, there you go. I give them chips and gravy or, you know, I love to give my kids good things. How much more does the Heavenly Father love to give us good things? So when we're dependent on him in a state of humility, he gives us our good things and then that results in how we treat other people differently too. So if we are being gifted by the things God has given us, in verse 12, we will then do unto others as we would have them do unto us instead of judging them. Can you see the complete opposite that Jesus produces in the life of a Christian? I would like to say that most human beings are pretty judgy. Like, let off the chain, with no fear of God, human beings really love a good judge session. You only have to look at Facebook. How good is it to pile on someone who is doing saying the wrong thing or on Twitter or whatever it might be? People love to judge. But Jesus is saying, be careful. Don't you judge someone else because you're going to get judged. And you need to remember the relationship you have with your heavenly father who gives you good things because he's also the judge of the whole world. He says, if you're going to think differently about life and stop judging other people and actually come humbly to God and trust in him and stop judging other people and love them instead, he said, you're going to be in the minority. Now, I want to just pause on this at verse 13 because I think at the moment a lot of Christians are feeling quite overwhelmed as I talk to them about what's happening in our world today because there's a lot of cultural change going on really, really rapidly. And Christians are really worried about it and talking about it a lot. Now, you might not be too worried or talk about it a lot, but some people are really worried. But what comes to my mind when people worry about how the broader population is travelling, I just keep coming back to the fact that Jesus says here, we're always going to be in the minority. So just live it out. Just do it. You know that old Nike ad, just do it, from the 80s? I used to like that ad. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many go through it. Just because the majority are heading towards some false ending that you don't want to go down doesn't mean you have to go there. They're not going to stop you from being who you are. Even if other people judge you, don't be judgy. Oh, look at that you know, right-wing person or that left-wing person or whatever. You know how everyone's like into you know, politics these days and everyone's judging everyone? Don't enter into that because you've got to be careful because you forget the plank that's in your eye before you take the speck out of someone else's eye. If you do that, it's going to be, you're going to be in the minority. And, and it's described like going through a gate. In verse 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only if you find it. You know, Jesus himself claims that he is the gate. It's not just a way. It's not a church, Sydney Church of Christ, that's the narrow way. It's Jesus that's the narrow way. So that's why I ended up not being taken up into that cult, because I realized that they're not the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. And his is the gate I have to go through. And even if lots of people don't go there, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go through the gate of Jesus. Because he himself, when he says the parable of the lost sheep, he says, I am the gate that you come through. I, I, I am the way. Um, true and false prophets. He goes on to say, watch out for the false prophets, which is what I engaged with at Sydney University. Watch out for the false teachers. For they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. See, there you go. Isn't that a really beautiful blessing? If you are not judging other people, you can listen to them. You ever thought of that? Like if I instantly judge Tim for, for getting into AFL, obviously, and go, I'm going to write that dude off because that's not rugby league. And you know, But how much would, richness would I miss out on if I wrote Tim off as an AFL supporter? I think you're an AFL supporter. That's, that's right, is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so rather than judging my brother, I actually think to myself, no, I should actually be spending more time thinking about how I live as a Christian, not how Tim lives as a Christian. And as I don't judge him, I'm actually going to relate to him differently and treat him as I'd like him to treat me, which is really beautiful. Like That means I'm going to be nice to him because I'd like him to be nice to me. And I'm going to listen to him talk about things in his life rather than judging him telling him what he shouldn't be doing in his life. Very, very different, right? False teachers will do the opposite. They keep judging. They come as in sheep's clothing, sitting next to you in a lecture theatre, saying that they're you know, just this really good Christian, but by their fruit you'll recognise them. So Jesus is really helpful here. If their fruit is anything different to the word of God, they're not a true Christian teacher. So if I was to preach anything here today that wasn't to be found in, this, in the word of God, you could say, I'm not going to listen to that. By their fruit, you'll recognise them. 
Do people pick up grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad tree bears bad fruit. Interestingly, when I rejected his advances, he was angry. Isn't that interesting? Anger is one of the fruit that you've got to watch out for, for false prophets. They become bullies and they get angry when you don't do what they say. Every tree, though, that does not bear good fruit, in verse 19, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. But just like there are false prophets, there are false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven in verse 21, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come and say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, baptise people in our church so that they could become true Christians? And Jesus will say, then I will tell them plainly in verse 23, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. It's very scary, isn't it? It's terrifying to think that I might be thinking I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Christian. Yeah. Well, to encourage you, just like you would know the false teachers from their fruit, you can have confidence or lack of confidence in your own salvation through your fruit. How, how does it come out in your life? Uh, are you a thorn bush that um, isn't bearing any good fruit? If you're a Christian, that'll terrify you because I know in my life when I'm not bearing good fruit, it terrifies me. But if I bear bad fruit and it doesn't terrify me, that's even more terrifying because that's an indication that I'm travelling on the wide road to hell. Because if I don't care about these things, then I'm a bit nervous that I'm not going to enter into the narrow gate and go through Jesus because I'm going to be proud rather than humble. Because the only way you can actually choose to be different to everybody else and go down the narrow path of Jesus is if I'm humble enough to admit that I can't make a big name for myself in this world and that's not my biggest thing in life. So if I'm interested in being popular and you know the big guy and being well liked by other people, I'll be merrily walking down the wide path towards hell with everyone because I'll be doing what everybody else says to me because I'll be listening to their judgmentalism and trying to fit into their judgmentalism. But if I'm free of judgmentalism and I'm following Jesus, I'm actually going to be building my life on Jesus, not on my own selfish pride. Uh, verse 24, Jesus unpacks this idea of building with um, this idea of wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who builds his house on the rock. I'm going to paraphrase this. If you went down a Cronulla and you're allowed to build anywhere you wanted to and you built on the low tide mark at Wanda Beach, you'd be a fool. Because you could build the most beautiful house imaginable on the low water mark and when the tide rises it all gets swept away because if you build on the sand when the water comes verse 26 the house will fall down but if you build a multi-story tower on Cronulla Point on the rock and the sea goes up and down doesn't bother you does it because you're on good foundation so Jesus is trying to help us here with this ideas because he's saying not only is he like a narrow gate but he is also a foundation for your life that you can build on. But he's asking you to build. You don't just get a spare block of land at Cronulla Point and then look at it and go, oh, isn't that nice? Like, what good is it to me to have a bit of grass on the end of the point if I can't live there? Like, I build a house. And so what I do is I partner with Jesus as he builds a house out of my life on his foundation. So really what Jesus is sort of saying is the starting point to understanding salvation is where do you build your foundation? In verse 27, if you build it in the right place, this is what happens. The rain can come down, the streams rose, and the winds blow and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Talking about the sands. But when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he is taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The house on the rock in verse 25, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it didn't fall because it had the foundation on the rock. So here we get given this really interesting duality right through this section. you either with Jesus or you're against him. If you're with Jesus, you'll know that you don't judge other people because you will actually treat other people the way you want to be treated. If you are a, a true teacher, you will teach people about Jesus and you'll bear good fruit. And if you're a true disciple, you'll actually hear God say that... Um, that you are welcome into heaven. But if you're a false uh, disciple, you won't. And it's all about, according to the building, whether you build on Jesus or not. 
So in chapter 7, we get a really clear warning that we need to build our life on Jesus. And we need not to pretend about that. Let's flick over to chapter 21 briefly. And let's look at how that helps us to unpack this just a little bit more. Um, before I read from chapter 21, uh, if, if this is upsetting for anyone, I do apologise. But you might have noticed on the news this week that it's the anniversary for the Port Arthur massacre. Uh, I think it was how many years? 21 years or something? It was a long time. 25. Well, um, the sad reality of that is the man that perpetrated that terrible uh, shooting spree down at Port Arthur, if you don't know about it, a guy got a gun and killed a lot of people at the Port Arthur um, historic site. But the really sad thing about that is this guy presented an image of himself as this really cash, sort of easygoing surfer. He had long hair, he had a surfboard on his car. And then how does someone like that, who's just this easygoing surfer, pull out a gun and go and shoot people? Well, he actually wasn't a surfer. When the police got his car after the shooting, they noticed the surfboard on his roof. But do you know what they found? He bolted the surfboard onto his roof racks. He never used it. Now, I'm a surfer. And the only reason I'm a surfer is because I actually surf. If I'd, I'm not a very good one, but I actually surf, right? And the same thing goes for being a Christian. If you're a Christian, you don't bolt on your Christianity on the roof of your car, driving around saying to everyone, I'm a Christian. You live as a Christian, right? And that's the fruit of your life. Well, in chapter 21, if chapter 7 isn't strong enough encouragement to us, let's have a look at the end of Jesus' ministry. And I want to really quickly fly over chapter 21 with us. I'm aware of time, but I think this is really helpful. Chapter 21, at the beginning, Jesus asked the disciples to go ahead of him and get a donkey that's tied up in verse 2. And indeed, they find it. Um, and Jesus gets the donkey and he rides into Jerusalem. Remember that story, the, the Palm Sunday story, where Jesus rides into Jerusalem? He gets on a donkey. He, go, he goes from Bethany, which is about a half an hour's walk away from Jerusalem. He goes from Bethany where he's staying down into Jerusalem, and he rides on the donkey into the city. And then when he rides in the city, everyone greets him as the coming Messiah, right? So here's this huge, exciting moment, which looks like it's the triumph of Jesus' ministry. He's welcomed into the holy city by its inhabitants as, as the Messiah. But they're not actually welcoming him as the true Messiah because this is what goes on to happen. Jesus goes into the temple and he sees that they're selling and buying things and ripping people off because the people are coming to the temple to make sacrifices to God, right? And there are people in the temple who are selling uh, doves and, and you know there are money changers changing money for people, but they're ripping people off. They're charging too much for the doves and they're not being honest with their scales. And Jesus gets really angry. Remember the story? So he's come into the city on a donkey, celebrated, comes in and sees Jerusalem. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer. You're making it a den of robbers. And so Jesus drives them all out of the temple. Now, this is a little bit confronting to all the people who said, we want a Messiah. Because what they want is a Messiah who doesn't tell them what to do. They want a Messiah of their own making. They don't want Jesus to come and say, actually, I don't like your practices. So here's the question for us today. If Jesus was to come into our gatherings and overturn our pulpits and our chairs and get angry, would we be happy to come to church next week? Because, see, the only person who can judge us is Jesus. Now, while it's helpful for us to point out to each other, by the way, hey, I think you could... You know, be careful of that in your life. You, you know, we do are we are meant to disciple one another, right? We are meant to be careful. And there's other passages that say we can we can sort of um, help each other with sin and stuff like Galatians six, carry one another's burdens. Like it's not that we can't ever point out in each other's lives that there's a problem. My wife points out my problems all the time, but she doesn't judge me. You see, because she leaves that to Jesus. But when He does turn up in your life and He judges you, are you humble enough to listen? Because the problem for us is we want to create a Jesus of our own making. Well, let me just unpack that. Let that sit there with you for a minute. Because in verse 17, he, left, he leaves Jerusalem and he goes back to Bethany. See that there in the text where he spends the night. Early in the morning, Jesus gets up in Bethany and he walks along the road back to Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of upset people in Jerusalem now. 
the mood has changed because the people aren't willing to let him judge them and they're really cranky now and that's going to lead to them executing him. Talk about flip-flopping. They've gone from praising him as the Messiah, having him judge them in the temple to get now really angry with him. Let's kill the dude. That's basically what they've done. But let me just set the picture geographically for you for a second. Bethany is higher than Jerusalem, which is interesting because Jerusalem is Mount Zion. But as you go down, I've never been to the Holy Land, but apparently as you go down from Bethany, you can actually go down the road to this day and still look down over the Temple Mount, which now has the mosque on it and all that. But in Jesus' time, he's walking down the road and he sees Jerusalem over here. Imagine walking down, like Blue Mountains, coming down the Blue Mountains and you can see the city of Sydney down in the distance. It's sort of like that, right? He's looking down on Jerusalem. And what is the biggest aspect of Jerusalem that strikes his eye? What's the most standout feature of Jerusalem that Jesus would have seen? Temple. Apparently, the temple of the second temple built by Herod is one of the great wonders of the ancient world, and people would travel from Rome to look at it because it's so beautiful. Now, if he sees this beautiful white building with smoke rising up and thousands of people, I'm talking, you know, I'm talking like football crowds of people, maybe sixty thousand people in the temple forecourts. What would you assume about the people of Israel if you saw that wonderful building in the middle of their city? What would you assume? They're godly. They've built their biggest building in the centre of their city to their God. They must be so godly. From a distance, they look godly. But what did Jesus see when he went inside that temple? He just saw ugliness. He didn't see people who love God. He saw people who were using the name of God for their own benefit. Well, Jesus is early in the morning. He's on his way back to the city. He was hungry. Verse 19, he sees a fig tree by the side of the road and he went up to it, found nothing on it except for leaves. Then he said, you may never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. That's heavy. What? Has Jesus just got angry? Has he lost his temper? Is it like me when I go to, to uh, Heathcote drive through and they say, you have to wait for your coffee? I get cranky every time I go through there because I just want my coffee and I've got to sit there and I've got to wait for it. I don't know why at Heathcote. They always have to say, wait in the waiting bay. You might be more godly than me and never get cranky, but I get, I, I get cranky sometimes. Do you ever get cranky? Is Jesus being impatient and cranky? No. He's judging the tree because from a distance, the fig tree looked healthy. But when he got up close to it, the fig tree like the city of Jerusalem, had no fruit. So he wasn't getting cranky and frustrated because he wanted a fig, although that could have been part of it because that was the fast food of the time. That was like the Maccas of the day. Stop off at a fig tree on the way to Jerusalem. But Jesus isn't frustrated. He's giving the disciples a living parable to warn them about what he was teaching them in chapter 7. Don't pretend to be a Christian without fruit. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus replied, and this is the piece that I want to leave us with today. Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, when I first heard about that when I was a naive teenager, when I was 18, when I first read those kind of passages, I literally thought Jesus was talking about if you have enough faith, you could pray that the blue mountains would be picked up and thrown into the sea. I thought it was generic mountains. If you have enough faith, you could pray that the mountain... You know, to my shame, I actually went out onto my back deck one day at Guymi Bay and prayed that blue mountains would be thrown into the sea. I, had no, I wasn't thinking of all the poor people who live there, but I just wanted to say, God, I believe in you! I want you to throw the mountain into the sea. Nothing happened. I went inside and I said to my dad, how come the mountain didn't go into the sea? And my dad said, because it's not Jerusalem, you, you silly boy. What Jesus is talking about here is not just any mountain. He's saying, if you believe, you can even say, God, throw this Mount Zion into the sea and it will happen. Not because you have the faith and you just get cranky at the people in Jerusalem, but one day what I have judged this city for will come to full fruition. And in, in, in Revelation, we see that the city of Jerusalem will indeed one day be judged and thrown into the sea. And a new heaven and a new earth will be replacing the old heaven and the old earth. And the, the Zion that we have now in Jerusalem will be replaced with a heavenly Zion. But the judgment that is coming on Israel, which we see in part in 72 AD when the Romans sacked the place, because Jesus warned that that would happen, even that was a foretelling of the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem, you see. So what he's saying is, if you're a Christian, you will long for the day where everything will be judged, like this fig tree and like this city. 
Now, I'm not going to do this now because we don't have time, but if I could flick, have more time, in Mark is the other place that this story gets told. And there's an interesting piece of detail in the story in Mark that Matthew leaves out, which I, actually I will just quickly go to it. Mark 11, after Jesus says exactly what he says in Matthew, he says this interesting thing in verse 25 in chapter 11 in Mark. Same story being told by different authors. Matthew just decided to stop it at the, if you believe you can throw this mountain into the sea. But the point that I want to make today is based on, I think verse 25 of chapter 11 is going to link for us, chapter 7 of Matthew and chapter 20. Uh, 1 of Matthew. In verse 25, when you stand praying, oh, I'll read the whole thing again. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and do does not doubt in his heart but believes what he says, it will happen and it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer and believe, you will receive it and it will be yours. In other words, Jesus, like I've already said, Jesus is saying if you pray for something that's in keeping, with the kingdom of God, it will be done. So if you long for the day where all injustice is ended and people stop selling things in the temple and people don't get ripped off anymore, if you pray for that, you can believe in your heart that it will happen because God is going to do that. However, verse 25, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you from your sins. Isn't that a strange thing to add on to that? Well, it actually makes sense when you read it in context of chapter 7 because Jesus says, don't take the, the speck out of your brother's eye if you've got a plank in your own eye. If you stand here on Bethany Road and look down on Jerusalem and go, yeah, Jerusalem, you're just as unfruitful as the fig tree. What a liar. What a big noter. You're driving around with a surfboard bolted on your car. You're not even a surfer. You're a Christian who goes around you know, saying you're a Christian, but you're not as good a Christian as me. Be very careful because if you stand praying if you hold anything against anyone and you haven't forgiven them you'll be judged as you judge others as we began in verse 1 of chapter 7 so don't be like that guy who sat next to me at university and said you can only become a christian if you're as good as me what you need to do as a christian is if you have anything against anyone go and talk to them and forgive them because how are you going to be forgiven if you don't forgive others? Because the reality is if you dream that one day all evil will be destroyed, you've got to be careful you're not part of the evil. Because when the city of Jerusalem gets thrown into sea, you'll be thrown into the sea as well. And what we want to do is escape judgment, not be part of it. So we need to take Jesus at his word that we need to enter through the narrow gate, build our lives on his foundation, trust in Jesus alone, and because we are forgiven of all our sins because of what he's done for us, we will treat other people as we want them to treat us and we will actually forgive. And we won't be like Jerusalem and just look religious. We'll actually be saved and forgiven and transformed. And at the coming judgment, we'll be saved rather than judged. And so if you're wondering today how to be saved, the simple answer is have repentance of your sins and put your faith in Jesus and you'll be a member of the kingdom of heaven. And then if you live that out, build a house on that foundation if you like, you will actually treat other people as you not only want others to treat you, but as God has treated you. Amen.